Okay, well, welcome back, and thank you for, for joining this session. Um, our next speaker is here to discuss uh, how fear of flying affects airlines and passengers. Uh, Les Poston is an Australian-based clinical psychologist with 25 years' experience um, and history of treating anxiety disorders, especially the fear of flying. Um, his history includes facilitating the Australian Fear of Flying course, attending international airline crew and passenger disaster management training, providing consultation and training to flight crew peer support teams in stress management, and delivering treatment plans for hundreds of patients who <coughs> wish to fly better. Um, anyone here afraid of flying? Hands up. Oh, interesting. Okay. Well, Les, it's over to you. Thanks very much. Pleasure to be here. I've travelled a long way, and thank you very much to the uh, committee for taking a risk. Because I've not presented here before, they know nothing about me. So thank you very much for that for the education committee. I very much appreciate it. Fear of flying is my topic today. As you saw when the hands went up, not an infrequent thing in the community. In the aviation community, you may think it should be very well done, but in fact, as you'll see, it's not. If you were a psychologist, as I am. There were two times in the history of commercial aviation, or of aviation in general, when you may have thought, I want a different career. The first time would have been at the outset of commercial aviation, or of aviation in general, when someone said to you, oh, we have a, a seat on the wing, they really meant it. <laughs> this is, in fact, not an old photograph, just we tainted to look like one. It's, in fact, uh, a new photograph. For some reason, wing walking is back in fashion. Pretty girls in spandex, don't ask me why, but it's back in fashion. But the history of aviation and nervous flies, of course, back then as well, is actually quite interesting. Uh, this is a group of uh, the first flight attendants when United Airlines merged with Boeing Airlines. And this woman here, Ellen Church, was the very first flight attendant. She's a nurse. She was a nurse. She was actually a licensed pilot. Went to Boeing and said, I want to fly with you. And they all laughed at her and said, you're a woman, you can't fly. She was so eager to have a job in the airline industry that they said, well, you can be a nurse. And her specific task was to work with nervous passengers. Because these aircraft, of course, flew below the cloud, in the cloud, and you threw up a lot. And their job was to clean up the technicolor yawns, as we say in Australia. She gave way, of course, to others who then became flight attendants. And we have flight attendants, cabin crew all over the world. There's a, rest, a return to nostalgia in flight attendants, by the way. And nostalgia, if you don't know, is Greek for pain, for reliving pain or remembering pain. And if you're in the airline industry and you've been around a long time, you remember what a nice place it used to be in those early days of commercial aviation in the 60s and 70s, before terrorism and so forth. And the ABC television network here in the United States is trying to capture that nostalgia. Welcome to the Jet Age. Upon boarding, passengers are greeted by the international beauty and grace known as the Pan Am Stewardess. Are you wearing your girdle? Yes, ma'am. Oh, congratulations. They're on the cover of Life magazine. With a face like that, you'll find a husband in a couple of months. I'm not looking for a husband. I hope not. You're famous now. So this is starting September 25, and I'm sure you'll all be watching it. And those of you who've got young children, you'll be, of course, having them downloaded for you on BitTorrent if you're in another country besides America. As I will be. This is nostalgia for the old times, the good times that aviation used to be in. Remember I said at the beginning, there were two times when as a clinical psychologist you would have been run out of business. The first time, fear of flying. It was normal to have a fear of flying. The second time that we've been commemorating this past weekend where it was normal not to fly. It was normal to have a fear of flying. And many people came up to me, psychologists included, and said, your business must be booming. Of course, it was the opposite. Why was it the opposite? Because fear of flying, when it comes to psychology, is about helping people when they know I shouldn't have a fear of flying. I know it's safe, but I can't help it. I'm still fearful. After 9-11, it was normal to have a fear of flying. My colleagues and I, our businesses dropped. Does that make sense to you? Good. This is from the New Yorker, and I think this actually captures, this is September 24th edition, really captures the feeling of New York. I was in New York September 8, scheduled to go back October 11. I flew out on September 8, 2001. 
took the last answer flight, next to last answer flight, yeah. before it crashed and yeah. burned, and came back on October 3rd, when all my friends at home were saying, don't come back to the States, it's unsafe, and I said, I have to go back for my friends in New York, and to support what's going on there, and to put the finger to those who said, you can't fly. I had to do this, and I felt much better for doing it. But there's an interesting thing that happened. Last, two years ago, this article was published, Driving Fatalities After 9-11. A couple of economists went along and had a look and this is the major part that they took out of this. After controlling for time, weather, road conditions, other factors, we find that travellers' response to 9-11 result in, in 344 driving deaths per month in late 2001. Moreover, while the effect of 9-11 weekend over time, a total of about 2,100 driving deaths in addition to what would have ordinarily happened. So about two-thirds of those people who died in the World Trade Center, that number died additionally because they drove instead of flew. Okay? This is just new statistics, 2009. So then, the fear of flying, it was normal. And it's taken us quite some time to go back to the usual irrational fear of flying, which is where I work. If you talk to people in this business of fear of flying, this is the major article that was published in 1982 from the Boeing Corporation, the Journal of Travel Research, the authors, Dean and Whitaker, they were statisticians working for Boeing. Boeing commissioned the study. They wanted to know how do we put more bums in planes. Airbus was rising. Boeing wanted to sell more aircraft. The rumor has it that Paul Allen, who was the CEO of Boeing at the time, a relative, perhaps his wife, had a fear of flying. He really wanted to know what was going on. So he hired a whole bunch of people, looked into the research, had psychologists who were running programs come to Boeing, and they came up with this report. And the most telling part of the report, in 1978, one of every six adult Americans, in the time of 25 million, were afraid to fly. And the question that they want to ask, that Whitaker and uh, others want to ask, is really quite important. This is the question they want to ask. For society and air travel industry, there are two core questions. The first is whether fear of flying is a real problem in terms of its effect on the air travel industry or air travel behavior, and also, what can we do about this? Is it a real problem for the industry? And we can still ask this question in 2011, I think. It's still an issue we should ask. Otherwise, I would not be here and out of business. Because they're economists, they filled up the article. If you want the article, email me, I'll send it to you with lots of wonderful graphs. But there are a couple of interesting points to take out of it, and we can relate it again to 2011. What is the estimated impact on the air travel industry? Well, fear of flying is estimated to have cost the domestic industry 21 million trips, 6 million of them business, 15 personal, and if the average fare was $75, that 21 million trips adds up to $1.6 billion lost in 1978 alone. Now you have to now multiply that ahead for inflation to 2011 and ask, just because safety in aircraft has gone up quite extensively, does that mean fear of flying has gone down? The answer is no. It hasn't gone down. It's in fact, if anything, gone up if you think about it. No, we are going to think about this a bit later on. So 1.6 billion, by the time we add in inflation, plus maybe an increase of fear of flying in 2011, may in fact be $16 billion for the aviation industry. That's something that should be interesting. That's something that should fill this hall, not empty it, don't you think? Thank you. Good. So, a couple of conclusions. The industry as a whole has a 9% gain to be made in 1978 by treating or dealing with fear of flying in whatever way we can. 9% gain, that's big numbers. Second, they incorporate the Pan American survey. There's about 6,000 people were surveyed in 1978. And the Pan American fear of flying program, which was probably the first commercial one, they looked at that one. They discovered that people had strong preferences to fly Pan American when they did that course. The fear of flying program suggests that capturing size proportions of the fear of flying market may be a distinct possibility, even then, that's not why Pan American set it up. It was a PR exercise, and they had a very gung-ho pilot, Slim Cummings, who wanted to do this. And they said, yeah, go ahead. They discovered that they had huge loyalty that followed afterwards, and that's been reproduced since. That if you're the, you go with an airline, and they help you overcome a significant fear of flying, you will stay with them. And that's what happens. The only thing that will interfere with them, if their prices go up too much, the bottom dollar will win. But, uh, but all, all things considered equal, if you overcame your fear of flying with that airline, if they knew how to took care of you, you would stay with them. It's a form of brand loyalty that 
we don't hear about in these sort of conferences, do we? Third part, another consideration is that when people travel in groups for business or personal reasons, an individual, individual who's afraid to fly may bias the entire group not to fly. For instance, I see young people, 16, 15, 12, going for their first overseas excursion. They don't fly, their parents don't fly, grandparents don't fly, so one non-flyer can mean the whole family drives to a destination, or trains it, or ships. So one field of flyer isn't just one person lost to the airline industry, it may be four or five or six who will choose some other form of transport. So these are quite important things. And maybe the take home message for people like me was this that active cooperation from the therapeutic community, people like me, can be assured for fear of flying represents an area of extreme social need, high likelihood of success. We've got about an 85% success rate in our programs that we run, and a potential market, $978 of $500 million. You are part of the therapeutic market if you're involved in in-flight entertainment and the passenger experience. You're part of that therapeutic community. You help to have people have a great experience on board the flight. So you're part of us, not separate at all. In the time since, there have been three international conferences on fear of flying. The first one took place here in Tarrytown, in New York, in the university not far from there, in 1996. The second one, we had to travel away from uh, Tarrytown. We're going to head overseas to uh, Vienna, Austrian Airlines. Anyone from Austrian Airlines? Sponsored it. That was in 2000. And then we returned to the North American continent in 2007 to Montreal. And uh, this is, was held under the auspices of ICAO. They decided to take a really interesting look at this. They said, there's something going on here. We need to know more about fear of flying. And so they sponsored and I was lucky enough to present there. Out of the 2000 conference, probably what has become the Bible of fear of flying for people like me was published. And they suggested that fear of flying is heterogeneous, it means there's many different ways to experience it. So there are multiple presentations. Different people, there's no one explanation for it, which means you need more than a single in intervention. Unfortunately, most airlines who used to sponsor these programs put 25 people in the group, gave them the same course, and expected the same outcome. Because it's heterogeneous, you don't get the same outcome. You have to vary it. So if we think about people, on board an aircraft. Now, psychology, by the way, tends to divide things up into thirds. A third of people who come to psychologists do brilliantly well. A third do reasonably well, hold their own, don't go backwards. A third, on the other hand, do go backwards. It's a mismatch, misdiagnosis, rules of thirds. On board a plane, I want to suggest to you that also operates a rule of thirds. A third, love flying. Doesn't matter what happens, turbulence, doesn't, I don't care, I love it. Just want to go, want to get there, love it. The whole experience of flying, not just getting to the destination. Who belongs in that category? There you go. A third, you just, I just happen to put you up at the pointy end because it helps the experience, doesn't it? Yeah. A third in the middle, tolerate it. I can take it, I can leave it, it's the quickest way to get there, it's not expensive, it's fine. I, I have a little bit of anxiety every now and again, but I'm okay, generally speaking. But there's a third on board any flight, I want to suggest to you, who don't want to be there. If you just beam me up, Scotty, that's the way I prefer to go. I don't want to be there. These are the people who are potentially that third who will not want to fly with your airline because you're the one that got me so scared in that last turbulent flight because you didn't take care of me, you didn't know how to. That's why it's important. So every time you get on board a plane, have a look around. About a third of the people on board that plane don't want to be there. They'd rather do something else instead to get from A to B. Okay? So let's have a think about who those third are. I put up that external and internal. That third or even that two thirds bring to the plane experiences, that's the internal, and receive on the, on the plane external in, talk, in terms of trying to explain to you what's the causation of fear of flying. So if you look at the external, common one, turbulence. You rocked me in my seat, I felt like I was going to fall, I thought the plane was going to crash, I don't like it. Turbulence falls into that super fear we call falling. Basic, basic fear, don't need language for it. This is what scares the heck out of people. I'm out of control, the plane's falling, what's going to happen? Turbulence. Why pilots never say, we're going to pass through some turbulence, may I remind you, turbulence might be uncomfortable, but it's not unsafe, I don't know, that's what they should say, but they don't. Because we don't ever mention the word safety, except put your safety belt on for safety. 
What else? There may be normal but scary incidents that might happen, such as, rarely, an aborted landing or takeoff. There might be sounds that are scary that don't make sense to people, grinding sounds, flaps coming out. I remember when ANSA first got their A320s, the cabin crew who were flying at the first time thought there were dogs loose underneath when the flaps came out because they went, roo, roo, roo. They put on air pods, roo, roo, roo. They thought the dogs had gotten loose. Can you imagine what it's like for passengers? <laughs> who let the dogs out? Exactly right. And of course, there are vibrations as big 747s take off, lots of power, the thing shakes like crazy, there's a million different parts on board, you're going to get vibrations. That scares people, you feel it as well. Lots of scary situations, lots of scary sensations. And then finally, there are illusions on board. Plane takes off, nose comes down after 12 degrees, power comes back, you turn, you feel like the plane's falling. It's an illusion, it's a motion illusion. We're still going faster, but we're not going as fast as we did before. It feels like a deceleration. So we're not very good at measuring velocity, but we're very good at measuring acceleration, which is a change of speed. So it feels like you're falling. Normal. Now, internal is what we bring to the aircraft experience. So there's often people who walk on board with pre-existing conditions. One, they may already have a panic attack, panic disorder. Runs through the population between 3 and 5% at any one time. Pre prevalence rate, about a quarter of us will have a panic attack in our lifetime. Not at all uncommon. Second, we may have a fear of certain things, such as heights. Very common. Pilots have fear of heights too. That's why they become pilots, to control it. Three, entrapment. We used to call this claustrophobia, not a very good term. It's entrapment. It encompasses all sorts of terms. I can't get out when I want to. I'm in a tube going at 600 miles an hour. I can't get out. So often these people have, tr have troubles with bridges, tunnels, elevators. Anywhere I could be trapped and I can't get out. And for 12 hours, it took me 20 hours to get here. Separation issues. Often we see children who've had separation anxiety issues, school refusal as adults often have separation issues the first time they leave home, leave their parents, go somewhere, separation issues. And then finally, people who operate at the sea level, sea level of businesses, have lost of control. I run a company of 10,000 people, now I'm on board a plane which is run by 10,000 people, faceless, don't know who they are, who runs the show, can't do what I want to do, I've just got to sit here and bear it. Loss of control issues. So these are the common things that we see happening. Um, I'm going to borrow a little bit of Boeing and show you this video from the new 747. It's not the best effort on my part, but you'll get the picture in a second. So this is the interior of the new 747-800 that you're probably very aware of. I think Boeing thinks that everyone who's going to fly in the plane is a Gen Y person. But this is a little screen that they put up. It actually is a liquor cabinet, I think. But it's actually a screen. And we in psychology think about objects as being screens sometimes for our feelings that we place upon that object feelings. We call it projection. So if ever you've sat in front of your computer and hasn't done something, it's crashed, and you've lost all your work, you want to go whack it, that's projection <laughs> onto the computer. You really want to whack the guys who are about 60 miles that way in Redmond. Yeah? <laughs> so people can, <laughs> he got it very good, people can project onto the experience. What happens if you take me to a difficult experience or take me from a difficult experience we will sometimes attach to the object that took us there our feelings. So for instance, we might be going to a happy occasion, such as a wedding. But weddings are always fraught with anxiety. Am I doing the right thing? Is it the right person? What's going to happen? Do I like my in-laws? Well, so plans that take you to difficult circumstances, but pleasurable, may also become difficult experiences. The obvious one, going to a funeral, and the plane takes you there or back from it, or maybe you're going to visit someone who's about to die. Lots of experiences like this. Performance anxiety issues. We hear often of athletes who refuse to fly for fear of flying, but often the case is that for performance issues, anxiety about performing in front of large crowds. If the plane is taking you to where some place where you might literally die on stage, you will attach those feelings to the object that took you there. And then finally, maybe we're going off to an interview somewhere, some other sort of performance. We can again, if I'm take, being taken to or from a difficult experience, my session here failed, no one turned up, it was terrible, you can attach it to flying. Let me show you an email that came to my website, or to me, just before I left for the States. This is Saturday night, I came in on Sunday. Uh, I'll read it to you, because you're at the back, you can't see it. Total stranger, never, never don't know, just picked up my website. 
Hi Les, I'm based in Queensland and have come across your site before. I've just found it again recently as my grandfather has died and I will need to fly back to the USA for the funeral. I'm hoping to fly on the 30th of September. I've been fearful of flying for around eight years. Each flight seems to get worse and what started as a mild dislike has turned into a fully fledged fear. The last few flights I took included two terrible flights in which I totally believed I was going to die. One was due to a terrible noise in the engine on takeoff and the other was severe turbulence on takeoff and landing on a flight between Brisbane and Melbourne. This was my last flight and for the first time ever this June I decided not to fly to a conference that I really wanted to attend. I cancelled solely because I didn't want to get on an aircraft. I feel like I need to be back in the USA and I'm making arrangements to go but I'm terrified of 20 hours on a plane and then the same to come home. I'm in Brisbane, so I'm sure if you can help me, but anything you can do would be appreciated. Cheers. So I want to introduce you for a moment to Dan Gilbert. Dan is a psychologist at Harvard, and last year he made a, uh, a documentary series on the PBS network called This Emotional Life. Three-part series, very good series. You should try to get a hold of it. But the middle section is devoted to our various feeling states, anger, happiness, depression. And this one that we're going to look at is on fear. And it just so happens that the particular fear they observe is fear of flying, lucky me. So I want you to watch this just for a minute and you'll see this young woman who's from Harvard and her fear of flying. Fear. Christina Kelly is a freshman at Harvard. She's a great student and a terrific athlete but she's deathly afraid to do something that millions of Americans find easy. I am afraid of flying. It's not rational and I know that, but at the same time, that's definitely just what makes it a phobia. I just can't. I know it's irrational and I can't do anything about it. It's not that I'm afraid that they're gonna go crashing to the ground or that someone's gonna, you know, try to take it over or anything, but there's not really anything that I can like pinpoint as why I'm afraid, and so I think that kind of adds to the whole like overarching fear. So this is an interesting presentation. We're seeing more of someone who says it's not this, it's not that. I don't know what it is, and because she's bright, this really disturbs her because she's a bright problem solver. She's got to Harvard. Two percent who like get into Harvard. I can't solve this problem. What's wrong with me? And this is a very common presentation nowadays. So that's fear. We need to understand this a bit. Sometimes you'll hear people talking about fear in these sort of terms. False evidence appearing real. And just last two weeks ago on a television program, I saw someone actually say it. False evidence appearing real. It's a place of sports psychologist on a, com on a show called Necessary Roughness. Uh, I want to say to you that uh, I don't believe that's true. I actually think it's wrong. And it's wrong for a variety of reasons. And we need to look at some brain studies to actually understand this because anxiety is the subjective experience of the fear response. It asks us what if, what might be, and we jump to conclusions. We can do it not just on the day of flying, but three weeks ahead of it. What if, what might be. The fear response, on the other hand, brings us what now. It causes us to take action. So any good fear of flying program teaches people to take action rather than stew in worry. So we need to look at some brain studies about this. Here's our brains, you've each got one of them, I hope. It, we've learned more about the brain in the last five years than we have for the last 5,000 years. We've made some major breakthroughs. Just to let you know, the brain can be divided up into these three sections. That yellow one is the brain stem. Blood pressure, heart rate, digestive system. Set and forget stuff in your basement. Next level up where that amygdala is, amygdala is Greek for almond, the ancients named brain parts, not over function because they don't understand it, but over appearance. It controls our fear and emotional response. Up the top part, the frontal lobes, which we have almost exclusively in the animal kingdom, is where we do our thinking, our planning, our designing, but it's slow. The amygdala, it's fast. It's really connected up to that lower part. Okay? It gets lots of sensory signals really quickly. The frontal lobe, on the other hand, gets things slowly. And what I want to point out to you is that when we get sensory information, the amygdala gets it twice as fast as the frontal lobe which means by the time you start to think about what should I do here, your amygdala is already kicking in a flight or freeze reaction, which is the nervous grip of the seat, which is the worst thing to do in turbulence. 
worst thing to do is to grip because you bring on even more of the freeze response and convince yourself it really is dangerous. You get it? You actually engineer your own anxiety. So we have to teach people about this. And we do this because in this menu we have the gold standards. Let me share with you the gold standards. There's 10 of them. I'm just going to put them up really quickly because we're going to record this for later on. But the most important things, give people some aviation knowledge, not too much. Don't show them air crash investigator. They won't be able to put it into practice. They understand it. When they've done really well, then they can look at it, but not during it. Deal, help them deal with their thoughts and reality. Teach them how to label anxiety. It's not on or off, which is what panic feels like. It's one or it's a five, it's an eight. I can bring it down to a four. Breathing techniques, education about the biology of fear. Have a good sense of humour when you do this work because it's hard work. You've got to have a sense of humour. Uh, you've got to be trained. Most psychologists aren't trained to do this sort of work. They have zero knowledge of aviation. I think you have to have some knowledge of aviation, for, at least for credibility's sake. Um, they've got to be active in public use and also take a score to flight. Lots, lots of psychologists will not do that, I think, because they have a fear of flight. Why? There are new challenges that face us, such as uh, dress codes, <laughs> which is coming to be in our days. But every time you see a challenge like this, we should think about it as an opportunity. But, so there are new opportunities I want to go through. This came from the, that third international conference. Uh, what used to occur, this is not my slides, as you can tell. Um, airlines used to run uh, free or flying programs. They're not doing it anymore. They've dropped it. It's not their interest. But we've just been talking about what's happened with low-cost airlines. This is how many people think about low-cost airlines. It took me about two seconds to find this many pictures of low-cost airlines. Budget airlines, which are challenging the last vestige of the fearful flyer, and that's cost. Now everyone can fly. The cost is the last thing. No more excuses anymore. You've got to fly. Um, I like this one. This is an airline trying to educate the public. I'm particularly impressed with this one, but I'm not too sure what their lawyers were, with the Louis or Mile High Club Initiation Chamber. So I'm not too sure about that. But what I want to suggest to you in the airline business is that at each step of the flying process, try and accommodate the customer. There are hurdles along each way where they can easily pull out. Think about your passenger. Think about their experience, which is what we're here for. This is me trying to get a booking for a patient on Jetstar. I can't really advance it, but essentially, it took me ages to get through this. Every second of the way, there were hurdles. Do you want this? Do you want that? Do you want to pay for your luggage? Do you want to get on board first? Do you want to get there? Half a dozen different times just to get through, just for one flight to get up there. And your nervous patient, nervous passenger, who has to go through them, excuse me, through these hurdles, at each step can easily pull out and say, it's just too much, it's overwhelming to me. So we won't worry about this. What I want to suggest too, think about what Steve Jobs has said about Apple. We got a brief mention of Apple in the, in the session before. This is what he had to say, surprise and delight your customers, which is about under-promising and over-delivering. Give them a terrific service. And so what I want to suggest is this. If you're in the cabin management position or check-in, don't upgrade fearful flies. It might make you feel good. It makes their experience worse. Why? You reinforce their fear. You make them feel special because they have a fear. That will not help them. That makes it worse. Because when they do the return leg, back in coach, don't. I know you want to do that. You want to be helpful. Don't. You see me, fine. But then, no. Second, be visible. They look at you like hawks to make sure that everything's okay. Smile, be okay. Don't say to them, at any point of the process, you'll be fine. You don't know. They will, that will cheese them off like no, nothing at all. What you could say is, we have great crew who know how to assist. We understand, we can assist you. Or, there's information on board, our website, that passengers say really helps. I include a website because this is where information should go. I've only been to one airline website which even mentions fear of flying, and that was Finnish Air. No one else mentions it. This is um, from Apex here in, uh, in um, Long Beach, I think it was, in February, where Jetstar leaks out, they shouldn't have, they leaked out some information about the new experience on board Jetstar aircraft, which is our budget airline in Australia. Uh, about the iPad, there's nothing to say that on the iPad you could not have an area there. You don't call it fear of flying, you call it better travelling, and you include hints about fear of flying in that, but you don't call it fear of flying, for obvious reasons. You try to be helpful, focus on the positive, not the negative. 
and here are some of the possibilities. This is what I said to my patients to say, this could be included on the website. Hi, I'm in surgery, I need not to mention your name, they don't care. Where are you? My first flight after my fear of flying course. I'm curious to see how I'm going to go, rather than scared. If a crew member should could check for me after the middle service, I'd be happy. My patients love it, the flight crew love it. And this is when they say it here at this point. Why? Because at this point they could easily bore, and this is a distractor, it keeps them focused. So I thank you very much for your time. Thank you. My apology, I have to uh, fear of memory. Um, Captain Todd Middleton was unwell, he was due to speak. Uh, so Les Flo flew solo today. That was a joke. <laughs> and that came from Les, not me. <laughs>